Denializing Science Part 1 What Happens When We Die Welcome back to Beyond Psychology, Arbitrarily Adam here, or Metaphysical Axiom if you like. This video is for the purpose of increasing our awareness about the scientific facts surrounding death. We must conquer our fears and face the facts of our reality. Observing these facts will alleviate a large percentage of said fears. The outcome of all this is something I refer to as solace in science. But after you're done watching this, you're going to be in a far better psychological state than ever achieved before in all of human history. So let's start with the obvious observations. In religious texts, there is the rebirth and reincarnation. We can observe a corpse breaking down and being eaten by animals, then we logically deduce that that organism's physical matter is now part of the earth or the scavenging animal that it was eating. There you have the start of those myths. Part truth, and part flights of fancy mixed with a bit of fairy tale in order to sell it. As people seem to not be able to escape their perception of individualism, because the axioms of our existence are just too complicated, we attach the concept of a soul. A psychological sales technique. You see, in all religious text, there's a bit of truth braided in with the loads of bullshit. For a bit of a scientific perspective, when we die, decomposition occurs. This is part of the circle of life. Life feeds on life. Entropy fuels evolution. Matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. This thing we call death is analogous to the caterpillar chrysalis to butterfly. At a particle perspective, we are transmuting. Now I'll give you a little bit of the science so you can specifically understand what I'm saying and understand that it is 150% the fact of our reality and not just a belief or a vapid opinion. This is axiomatic. Unless you're going to say that none of this actually exists and it's all a dream, which is complete conjecture and no real reason to assume such thing. So for the sake of reasonability, let's say that there is a physical reality going on here that you are made of what we call carbon and these other structural geometry features and expressions physically into this world. The world is physical. Let's not waste time with such silly debates. Scientists have taken a dead body and weighed it. Then they broke it down and separated all of the chemical elements that make up the body. They then weighed it again. Because of this experiment, we know exactly what the body is made of. We must keep in mind that all of these chemical elements that the body breaks down into are exactly what plants require for their biological functions. Plants eat us when we are dead, and we become the plants. Again, this is a fact, not a belief or an opinion. It's axiomatic. Now calm down, I will explain. We are in a process of constant transmutation. If we look at this from an ecological standpoint, in a natural environment, we die on the forest floor. We then get eaten by bugs and or other scavengers, which means we get turned into shit. Yeah, sorry, but it gets better, please. Hang on like a dingleberry. Shit gets turned into dirt and or worm food, and then the shit has become worm castings. Worm shit. Then fungus and microbes in the soil break it down even further. All of this serves chelation processes, which is part of the complex chain of cause and effect that is necessary for plants to take up micronutrients from the soil. Suggest we all read up on chelation further. I'm not going to get into that here, it gets a bit heavy. So, our bits and bobs, our particles, are now ready to be taken up by the plants and become the future forms of complex biology. Once eaten, the forms of biology, plants, use our bits and bobs, our particles, to make new cells. More on death from a cellular perspective. Death doesn't happen all at once. We are actually dying every day. Interesting side note, 70 to 80% of the dust in our houses is our dead skin cells. Dead you is just hanging around the house for days. Reason to vacuum, perhaps? Does that make vacuuming some sort of spiritual, ritual, funeral type thing? Okay, let's get back to the meat of this. Our cells die, and we eat food. And we use those proteins and aminos and fats, as well as trace elements we get from food to create new cells. These new cells are not a perfect duplicate, and they aren't the same you. Every day we become a slightly different organism. So in reality, we are not individuals, but rather masses of microbiological symbiotic consciousness in a process of perpetual transmutation. I'll give you a second to let that one sink in a bit. Okay, ready for more? Over a 7-10 to 10 year period of time, the majority of your physical material is replaced by new physical material. 
For every bit of matter that you take on, you give something back. Unless you're getting really fat. Even if you are getting fat, you're still throwing off dead cells and replacing them. I just want to remind everybody that so far, the only thing I've done is state the facts. Tough for some of you to face, but if you don't, then you're falling victim to a life of delusionally unhealthy perceptions of reality. And that leads us to the philosophical as well as psychological perspectives. What is the meaning of all these facts, and how is it applicable to the way we live our lives and how we treat each other? Well, once a deep understanding of this is acquired, we understand that it's the carbon and the chemicals that are in a certain structure, along with other carbon, carbon chains, carbon-based life, that yield this ability to sense the environment, awareness, consciousness. So what this means is that we turn into the future forms of consciousness, particle by particle. We disperse, we share all of the same matter and energy. This understanding leads me to mention something I refer to as scientific morality. This understanding of death increases our empathy. We know that we could just as easily become the impoverished person being abused or the dog getting beat. It is an inevitability that we will experience this thing we call life and or consciousness again in the future forms of biology. There is no escaping this axiom of our existence. So what does this mean for the meaning of life? What does this mean for individualism and personal possessions? What does this mean for wealth? We don't know what the meaning of life is, but the more aware we become of the observable, then the more we understand what we are doing, and perhaps that's as close as we'll ever get to the meaning of life. Which is experiencing sensory information, while matter and energy of the universe is in a form of structural geometry that yields the ability to do so, in the form of a massive microbiological symbiotic consciousness, the path of least resistance can be equated to what we call pleasure and comfort as well as safety and security. This is our ultimate goal from a biological perspective, correct? So how do we achieve that goal? The only true wealth that any of us can possess is something I refer to as the wealth of intention for our future forms of complex consciousness. Because of all these understandings, my goal has become the manifestation of patches into our world to perpetuate pleasure, comfort, security, and more freedom of mobility as well as experimentation for our future forms. Some people have a 10-year plan, but I have a 1,000 or even a 10,000 year plan. Better to be concerned with ensuring a smoother ride for every form of life that we will be part of, rather than what the nearsighted individualists are concerned with, such as me, I, and whatever else perpetuates the primal and or biological directives, the greedy endeavors. From a psychological perspective, I have some thoughts that I think need to be shared and may be appreciated by some, if not the entire species. Our fear of not knowing in general, and largely our fear of death, has perpetuated much of our delusional states. I'm referring to religious beliefs, logical fallacy braided with cognitive bias to the point of insanity. We could not accept death. That was too much loss to bear. So we fabricated the concept of a soul as well as a creator. Unfortunately, this equation, simply put, religion equals soul equals individualism equals greed slash ownership equals slavery, as well as the separation of us from the natural world and our naturally tribal state. At that point, we become victims of our own manifestations, victims of the out-of-control imaginations of the blindfolded children of the universe who run with scissors. Divide and conquer becomes the inevitable outcome. Regardless of the intended outcomes for religious beliefs and moralities, unfortunately that's not what comes from it most of the time. Road to hell paved with good intentions and all. When we believe we are this lone individual and that we only live once, the brain, with the help of the English language, has adapted the inner monologue. It reads something like this. What should I do? What should I eat for breakfast? How do I get new material possessions? Me, 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 I, 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 I. And people say that they are moral, and that they do good for others. But in reality, it's not for others. Every time they do something they consider to be good, they use it to make them feel good about themselves. It's all about self-affirmations. If you don't understand why we're tribal and empathetic, then any tribal or empathetic action just becomes a delusion. You're faking it. We must have an understanding of why we do what we do. Some of what I'm saying is theory and some of it's a fact. It's just a matter of time before the majority realizes these axioms. If you're trying to tell me that everything I'm saying right now is an opinion, then what that actually means is that you just don't know that it's a fact. Yet. It's all about the right questions. We have been living for thousands of years with a perceptional paradigm of excessive individualism, and look around. 
Look what our overly simplistic, delusional perspectives and fill-in-the-blank nonsense have perpetuated. Yet we continue to hold on to our culture as it is related to our concept of self, and to let go of those self-affirmations is to allow the self to die psychologically. We are doing the same things over and over again while expecting different results, which equates to insanity. We cannot fix our problems using the same tools that were used to create them. Logical fallacy braided with cognitive bias equates to insanity. Welcome to the thought revolution. We must increase our complexity of our perceptions so that we match the physical facts of reality. Otherwise, we are attempting to force reality to adapt to our delusion, which will be our inevitable demise if we continue on that path. It's time to let go of our fears. It's time to grow up as a species. We need to face the facts of our reality and acquire solace in science. There is no point in fearing the inevitable. Do not fear the fact that we have been shit before and we will be shit again, but rather rejoice in the fact that we will experience the flight of a bird swimming as a dolphin and indeed, inevitably, this thing we call a human existence in our future. As long as we don't destroy the world to the point where it no longer supports our complex forms. These are perfect examples of what I refer to as solace in science, the wealth of intentions for the future, and scientific morality. It's a perfect example of denializing science. Thank you 1% of the world that bothered to watch this. <laughs> Have a good one, people.